uh, harvest time. We had kind of early, nice warm weather, and I got up this morning, it's 36 degrees. I thought, man, oh man, let's not get any colder around here. It's going to be okay though, right? It's going to be okay. Good to see you guys. How you been? Good. Glad you're here tonight. Romero, why don't you pray for us? Amen. Thank you for your giving tonight. After we receive the offering, we'll dismiss the youth. And don't forget, coming up this month, the 15th, the 16th, and the 17th of April, uh, we have our district convention is going to be here in our church. Uh, Wednesday morning at 10 o'clock, there's going to be a ministry, a women's ministry, which is not just for the women, it's for everybody. But that's when uh, the women, are different churches, the representative of the, of the churches, bring their um, their offerings that you guys are planning to give. What's it called? The uh, alabaster box. That's what we're going to do here. But that's when everybody on on the fifteenth and when and that service is when all the churches bring that offering together. Have a special guest speaker. It's going to be ministering that day, and so we look forward to that. Uh, that be Wednesday morning. If you can make it, 10 o'clock. If you make it to any of the, in all the services, it'd be great. Wednesday night at 7, uh, we're going to have a service here. It's going to be a communion service where all the churches from our district, from Oregon, Southern Idaho, will all be here. Hopefully, you'll be able to come and join us. we have a special meeting. Thursday is going to be a business meeting throughout the day, and then Thursday night, again, it's going to be open session of, of a special ministry. It's great singing, good Pentecostal stuff is going to happen. And then on Friday, the youth have the all day. They're going to have start off with a talent expo, and uh, some of our youth are going to be involved in that. Youth, again, from all over the district will be involved with that. Then they have a youth rally, if I understand right, that day as well. So um, just a lot, of, a lot of activities happening. That's Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, 15th, 16th, and the 17th. Uh, again, pray for it when you're fasting and praying. Not only pray for our church, but pray for this meeting and for all the pastors that will be here. Uh, as pastors, we go to conventions sometimes just hoping and praying that somebody will say something that will give us just a word of encouragement. Sometimes so many pastors are just right on the edge of just giving up and walking away from it all. And I know, especially early in my ministry, I used to go to these conventions and I'd go to different uh, functions we had. And when Sharon and I first started, we were in a group that every month they had a special uh, uh, meeting. And if it wasn't for those special meetings, I probably would not have made it through the first two, three years of my ministry. I wouldn't have made it. But every time I went, there was just a word of encouragement. Somebody said something. Somebody helped me out and just to get me through. And sometimes we need that. We all need that as church. But pastors are just like everybody else. In fact, the pressure on them is sometimes is greater than what we feel even when we're not pastoring. And so uh, pray for those pastors, pray for their families, that God's going to do something wonderful for them. All right, we're going to look at a, a lot of scripture, okay? Is that okay? Yeah, we're going to start in Exodus chapter 15 and verse 26. We have been talking about signs and wonders. We've been talking about the great commission that Jesus gave to the disciples. He said, go and preach this gospel to all the world. Baptize people in the name of the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. And he told them as you go, he said, these signs shall follow those who believe. And he talked about casting out of devils. Talked about picking up serpents of all things, and they won't harm you. And he said, you'll lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. And I've kind of been on that theme of laying hands on the sick for the last several weeks. And today what I want to do is I want to go back and, and include the Old Testament in that same thought. There's, we are, as Pentecostals, we're pretty much convinced healing is for today. Does everybody believe that? They may not believe that, we'll lay hands on you, see if God can heal you. <laughs> but we believe that is true, but there's a lot of people in the Christianity, they don't believe that. A lot of people in the Christian world, they think that the miracles that took place was when Jesus was here, 
and through the era of the apostles, and then that had stopped. And there's no need for miracles today. Well, what we're going to look at is God's plan has really never changed for people. Clear back in the beginning of time, clear back when he first created mankind, he had healing that was available, and there were miracles. Throughout the Old Testament, it is filled with stories of people who were healed, filled with miracles that took place, when Jesus came on the scene, he just amplified it all. But the Israelite people, they knew, they knew that God was a God who healed. Back in Exodus 15, 26, where we're going to start, God's speaking to them. Moses is speaking to them about uh, what they should be doing and, and the, what will take place if they obey the voice of the Lord. And he said, if you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, Give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes. I will put none of these diseases on you, which I have brought upon the Egyptians. For I am the Lord who heals you. He revealed himself. It was a, a, one of those names we have on the board back there, names of God. He revealed himself as God the healer. It's Jehovah Rapha, isn't it? Jehovah Rapha, God that heals you. I am the God that heals you. So we're going to look at some illustrations in the Bible about this great healing God of ours. And we're going to start in Numbers chapter 21. Numbers chapter 21. I'm going to read about the brazen serpent. Remember that story? Numbers 21, starting in verse 4. The Israelites were out in the wilderness. And the Bible says, Then they journeyed from Mount Or by way of the Red Sea, to go around the land of Edom. And the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. <clears throat> and the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our souls loathe this worthless bread. Now, I'm not going to talk about this, but this is just a side note. If you want to put together a, a message, a sermon, here it is. They loathed this bread, which was manna. Jesus said he was the manna from heaven. Well, the Israelite people in the wilderness said, we don't want it. They didn't like it. It wasn't good enough for them. They wanted something more, something different. Anyway, verse 6 goes on. So the Lord sent fiery serpents or poisonous snakes among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against, your, against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent, set it on a pole, and it shall be that anyone, everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole, and so it was. If a certain serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at that bronze serpent, he lived. The people were to look on the bronze serpent, look at this pole, and if they looked at it, they would be healed. I am the God that heals you. Again, God said, if you obey my commandments, if you do what I tell you to do, none of these diseases will come on you. They begin to murmur. They begin to complain against God, complain against God's provision, and complained about the leadership, Moses. And all of a sudden, these poisonous snakes came and began to bite people. Jesus said himself, he said, this whole picture is a picture of who Jesus is. That serpent on the pole was a picture of who Jesus is. He spoke this in John 3, 14. He said, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That whoever believes in him should not should have eternal life. So he said that was a picture of Christ on the cross. But we know that many years later after this episode, King Hezekiah, who was a good king in Israel, King Hezekiah had to destroy this, this relic. These people took this pole, this serpent on the pole, and over a period of time, they began to bow down and began to worship this they begin to offer incense to it. The Bible says in 2 Kings 18.4, 
It says that he removed the high places, he broke the sacred pillars, he cut down the wooden images, and he broke in pieces a bronze serpent, this thing here we're talking about, that Moses made, for until those days the children of Israel, they burned incense to it. So they took, they took something that God had, had told Moses to make, that if you look at this thing, you will be healed. And rather than giving honor over a period of time to the God that brought the healing, they were giving honor to that thing. This is not unlike what happens a lot of times today. People, we all have this tendency to look to either a person, to a, an object, to something that's going to bring about a miracle or a healing in our life, and we begin to honor that thing above its rightful place. We, take, we have a tendency to take people, for example, that have a, a, a miracle ministry or they have a healing ministry. And we look to that person and we exalt them to such high esteem that we almost make them godlike. We almost idolize them. We listen to every single word they say and, and believe that they can do no wrong. Unfortunately, when they do something wrong, we're very disappointed. What we need to realize is it's not the man, it's not the person some people honor the oil. They say, well, it's in the oil. No, it's not the oil. It's a God that's behind it all. God is the one that works through people. He works through the anointing of oil. He works through whatever means that he wants to work through, but we should never honor and exalt that above measure because it's a God that does it all. So Israel fell into this problem. We know that the apostles, they went out and they were laying hands on the sick and they were healing people. And people came to them, and they began to exalt them, put them in high esteem. In Acts chapter 14 is an interesting story. Verse 11 says, Now when the people saw what Paul had done, they raised their voices, saying in the Laconian language, The gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas they called Zeus, Paul they called Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. And then the priests of Zeus, whose temple was in front of their city, brought oxen and garland to the gates intending to sacrifice with the multitudes. But when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard this, they tore their clothes, they ran in among the people, crying out and saying, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men in the same nature as you. Notice that. He said, we're just like you. And he used the words that we have the same nature you do. We're not gods. We don't have godlike characters characteristics we're just like you we're human beings just like you we are men in this with the same nature as you and we preach to you that you should turn from these useless things to the living God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that are in them in other words Paul and Barnabas said you can't put us up on a pedestal it is dangerous to put people up on a pedestal Apostle Paul Barnabas who performed great miracles would not allow that to take place God alone is the only one that has the power to heal. And to him be all the glory and all the honor. And so we see in the Old Testament here in this first illustration, the brazen serpent, we see that through the disobedience of people, plague came upon them, disease came upon them. They turned to the Lord, they turned to Moses, they said, please forgive us for what we've done. We have sinned against God and Moses, we sinned against you. And so God turned the thing around. He allowed for opportunity for them to be healed because we serve a merciful God. But yet, we have see also in this story that we can all only honor God in his healing. The second illustration is found in Numbers chapter 12. Numbers chapter 12 and verse 1. The Bible says, And Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses, because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married. For he had married an Ethiopian woman. So they said, Has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? And the Lord heard it. And the man Moses was very humble, more than all the men who were on the face of the earth. And suddenly the Lord said to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, Come out, you three, to the tabernacle of meeting. So the three came out. And then the Lord came down in a pillar of a cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both went forward. And he said to them, Hear now my words, 
If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream, but not so my, Moses, my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. I speak with him face to face, even plainly, and not dark sayings. For he sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? So the anger of the Lord was aroused against him, and he departed. And when the cloud departed from the tabernacle, suddenly Miriam became leprous as white as snow. And then Aaron turned towards Miriam, and there she was a leper. So Aaron said to Moses, O oh my Lord, please do not lay this sin on us, in which we have done foolishly, and in which we have sinned. Please do not let her be one as one dead whose flesh is half consumed when she comes out of her mother's womb. So Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, Please heal her, O God, I pray. And then the Lord said to Moses, If her father had but spit in her face, would she not be shamed seven days? Let her be shut out of the camp for seven days, and afterwards she may be re received again. And so Miriam was shut out of the camp seven days, and the people did not journey till Miriam was brought in again. There's a lesson here we should not ignore. God reminded Miriam how he had chosen and he had blessed Moses. Moses was the anointed of God, and God said to her, Were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? Some people cannot seem to receive their healing because they've spoken against the anointed of God. And some people who even want to step out into a miracle ministry do not do so because they have spoken against the anointed of God. You see, we can't speak against God's anointed. Now, you look at this whole story, and what caused the problem was Moses married an Ethiopian woman. And the problem wasn't that she was an Ethiopian. The problem was that she was not a Jewish woman. She wasn't part of Israel. And so they rebelled against that and said, Moses has sinned, Moses is wrong. But see, every single person stands or falls before God, not before us. And again, we can look at people who have great ministries, people who are anointed of God and are doing great things, and if we look real close at them, you're going to see that they are flesh and bones just like you are. And they make mistakes just like we do. And they fail many times, and they make bad decisions just like we all do. <clears throat> but if we begin to challenge their ministry and challenge who they are and put them down, we're touching God's anointing. And sometimes healing does not come because we're judging somebody else. The Bible says not to judge others. We stand or fall before God. Now, if that person... That man or woman of God is doing something wrong. You know what? God has a way of pulling them up. He has a way of taking care of them. And so if we find ourselves challenging God's leadership, challenging God's anointed, we have to do the same thing these guys did. We have to go and we have to repent and say, you know, Lord, I, I repent that I did this. I remember years ago, there was a famous evangelist. And you all know him. He's dead now. His name was Oral Roberts. Oral Roberts apparently made a comment that if he didn't raise a million dollars, God was going to kill him. I don't know if he said that or not, but that's what I heard. I don't think he really said it that way. And so the news media, they picked this thing up, and they're taking off with it. And so in my little P mind, you know, I was just young, like one year in the ministry, I was thinking evil thoughts about this man. And I remember I was in prayer one time, and God spoke directly to me. And he told me this. He says, when you have done as much for me as Oral Roberts has done for me, you can criticize it. But until that time, keep your mouth shut. And so I went out and bought an Oral Roberts Bible. Still have it today. And I stopped talking against anybody that was doing a work for the Lord. Jesus told us to do that. He said, if the oxen is plowing the field, let them plow the field. They stand or they fall before God, not before us. So here we see the sin came upon Miriam because of her judgment, because of what she said, and she challenged God's anointed. We see that there was a disease that came, but we also see in God's mercy, when she asked for forgiveness, God not only forgave her, 
but God healed her. The third story is found in 2 Kings chapter 5. 2 Kings chapter 5. And verse 1. It says, Now Naaman, commander of the army of the kings of Syria, was a great and honorable man in the eyes of his master, because by him the Lord had given victory over Syria. Syria. And he was also a mighty man of valor, but a leper. And the Syrians had gone out on raids and had brought back captive a young girl from the land of Israel, and she waited on Naaman's wife. And then she said to her mistress, If only my master were with the prophet who is at Samaria, for he would heal him of his leprosy. And Naaman went in and told his master, saying, Thus and thus said the girl who is from the land of Israel, and then the king of Syria said, Go now, I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he departed and took with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothing. And then he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which said, Now be advised, when this letter comes to you, that I have sent Naaman, my servant, to you, that you might heal him of his leprosy. Now the Syrian king, his servant, Naaman, is the one that had leprosy. This little servant girl who was taken captive, she was from Israel. And this little servant girl said, there's a man in Israel, and he's a prophet of God, and he has a healing ministry. If only you can get him there. And so Naaman goes to his king, and the king of Syria sends his letter to the king of Israel. The king of Israel had no power to heal. The king of Israel was a wicked man at this time. But there was a prophet in Israel. Verse 7 says, And it happened, when the king of Israel read the letter, that he tore his clothes and he said, Am I God, to kill and to make alive? That this man sends a man to heal me, to heal him of his leprosy? Therefore, please consider and see how he seeks a quarrel with me. So it was, when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Please let him come to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. And then Naaman went with his horses and chariots, and he stood at the door of Elisha's house. I love this story. And Elisha didn't even go out there. Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh will be restored to you, and you shall be clean. But Naaman became furious and went away, and he said, Indeed, I said to myself, He will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the place, and heal the leprosy. Are not the Ab Ab Abina and the far part of the rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. And his servants came near and spoke to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more when he says to you, wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan. According to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. And he returned to the man of God, he and all of his aides, and came and stood before him, and he said, Indeed, now I know there is no God in all the earth, except in Israel. Now, therefore, please take a gift from your servant. But he said, As the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will receive nothing. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. So Naaman said then, If not, please let your servant be given two mule loads of earth, for your servant will no longer offer either burnt offerings or sacrifices to other gods, but to the Lord's. What Naaman was saying was, Give me some dirt that I can take home with me. Dirt from the prophet's house. Something that I can take back that is holy. Because he was going back into an unholy situation. Verse 18, yet in this saying, may the Lord pardon your servant when my master goes into the temple of Ramon to worship there. And he leans on my hand and I bow down to the temple of Ramon. When I bow down in the temple of Ramon, may the Lord please pardon your servant in this saying. And then he said to him, Go in peace. So he departed from him a short distance. But Jehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said, Look, my master has spared Naaman this Syrian 
while not receiving from his hand what he bought, brought. But as the Lord lives, I will run after him and take something from him. So Jehazi pursued Naaman. And when Naaman saw him running after him, he got down from his chariot to meet him. And he said, is all well? And he said, all is well, my master. He has sent me, saying, indeed, just now, two young men of the sons of the prophets have come to me <coughs> from the mountains of Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two changes of garment. So Naaman said, please take two talents. And he urged him to bound two talents of silver and two bags with two changes of garments and handed them to two of his servants, and they carried them on ahead of him. And when he came to the citadel, he took them from his hand and stored them away in the house. Then he let the men go, and they departed. Now he went in and stood before his master. Elisha said to him, Where did you go, Jehazi? And he said to him, Your servant did not go anywhere. Then he said to him, Did not my heart go with you when the man turned back from his chariot to meet you? Is it time to receive money and to receive clothing, olive groves and vineyards, sheep and oxen, male and female servants? Therefore the leprosy of Naaman shall cling to you and your descendants forever. And he went out of his presence, leprous, as white as snow. Elisha the prophet was greatly anointed of God. And apparently there were more miracles that took place than are recorded in the Bible about his ministry and probably Elijah as well because it was well known all around Israel that if you were sick you could go to the prophet Elisha and he could cure you he could bring the presence of God into your life and he could cure you and so apparently people looked to him to heal them through the power of God and then we have this obscure Israelite girl not even named she tells Naaman, this captain, and says, if only you can get to Elisha, if only you can get to him, God can heal you as well. Wonderful faith. And so the amazing part of this story is that Naaman obviously comes before Elisha. And Elisha says, doesn't even send, doesn't even walk out there. He just sends a messenger. He says, tell him to go down to Jordan, dip seven times. We just read the story. He walks away in a rage, changes his mind. He goes down. He's obedient. And through his obedience, he received his healing. But here's the good point in all this story. Is Elisha refused to receive any money for the gift that God had given to him. Elisha had a gift. And he honored God. He said, it is God who does this through me. And he refused to receive any money. The Christian world today, the church world today needs to understand this. We cannot buy this thing. We cannot give anybody enough money that has a quote-unquote gift ministry or a healing ministry to receive the healing. In fact, there is danger for anybody that charges for doing the work of the Lord. In... Uh, in our writings we have today, we have so much that we can glean from. We have this wonderful Bible that takes us through the book of Acts. takes us to a certain point of what happened there, and it kind of doesn't have an end to it. It just continues to go. We have all these ancient books that we can go back to today. People who wrote in the church age, the early church age, the disciples of the apostles, the disciples of John, the disciples of, of all these, you know, Peter and these different men, we have their writings. We have and we see how the early church was formulated and how correction came for different things that were happening. And I, 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 I like to read that. I like to read how they, they progressed, how we got to where we are today. And there was one author, he was about 200 AD, I think he was. He was a bishop at that time over the churches. And he, and he said, there's so many prophets in the land he says, some are good prophets and some are not. Some are true prophets and some are false prophets. So he laid out a description of how you know a true prophet from a false prophet. And understand, this is right in, in the infancy of the early church, uh, just taking off and starting to grow. And here's what he said. He said, one way you can tell a false prophet from a true prophet. If a prophet comes in and prophesies, if he asks for money for himself, 
he's a false prophet. That's how they, they gauged him. If he comes in and asks for money for anything else, for a charitable cause, for any other work, then he's a true prophet. But if he's selling his prophecies, he's a false prophet. That's how the early church gauged it. We need to gauge it the same way today. You cannot sell the gifts of God. And if anybody is saying they're doing something in the name of God and they're asking for money, then they're not of God. It's really that simple. Elisha refused to receive a gift from this Syrian, from this captain. He refused to receive it because he said, this is God doing it. But as we see in this story, Elisha's servant, Jehazi, he had a different opinion. Now, if we understand this, Jehazi was to Elisha what Elijah was to Elijah. When Elijah left, Elisha, if you see me go, you will have my anointing. Jehazi was positioned to receive the same anointing of Elijah and Elisha. That's who he was. He was the next one to come into that anointing into that gifting of miracles. But because he had a character flaw, his character flaw was greed. He wanted money. He did not receive that anointing from God. And even when he came back, God again in his mercy is seen here, is that it comes before Elisha, and Elisha gave him an opportunity to repent. He said, I was, my spirit was with you. I saw what you had done. Physically I wasn't there, but God showed it to me in the spirit. You did something you should not have done. And Jehazi could have repented right there, but he didn't. He lied. And because he amplified his, his lie and he amplified his greed, then a curse came upon him. He became a leper himself. And the Bible says not only was he a leper, but it went down through his generations because of his action. This is sad, a very sad story for Jehazi. But what is also sad is that we don't mention this too much in the church today. We don't warn people about what can happen when you disobey God. We love to tell people that God is a good God, which he is, and he's a God that will heal, which he will. But we also need to look at this other side of who God is, that there are people that are desiring a touch from God. But somewhere, they deliberately turned aside from God, following God. Somewhere, they deliberately despised their inheritance and they sold their birthright and they walk around like lepers today seeking somebody to help them, some kind of an anointing, somewhere they can take the next step. When all they have to do is repent, all they have to do is become honest with God and come before the Lord and say, God, I have sinned. Forgive me of my sin." But they don't do that. They walk in their pride. They walk in their arrogance. They see the church as a means of money. They are motivated by greed and gain rather than doing the will of God. And because they walk down that road, they don't see the, the true power of God. They still walk around as lepers. That's almost like a curse that's on their life. Again, we don't talk about that too much. But if people would face that, if we'd be honest before God with that, it could release healing into a lot of people's homes and a lot of people's lives and into a lot of ministries that could flourish. But we have one more. And that's in 2 Kings chapter 20. 2 Kings chapter 20, and that's Hezekiah, the king of Israel, who was a good king. Verse 1 says, In those days Hezekiah was sick and near death. And Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, went to him and said, to him, thus says the Lord, set your house in order, for you will die. Now, how would you like it if the most powerful, anointed prophet of the day, the closest man to God that you knew, came to you and say, you're going to die. Rather than living, you're going to die. I mean, how would you respond to that? Most of us would probably just throw up our hands and say, well, I guess this is God's will. I mean, the prophet, he's never wrong. This is Isaiah. He's prophesied some wonderful things. Verse 2 says, Then he turned his face towards a wall, and he prayed to the Lord, saying, Remember now, O Lord, I pray, 
how you have walked, I have walked before you in truth and with a loyal heart and have done what was good in your sight. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. And it happened before Isaiah had gone out into the middle court that the word of the Lord came to him saying, Return and tell Hezekiah, the leader of my people, thus says the Lord, the God of David, your father, I have heard your prayer, I have seen your t tears, surely I will heal you. On the third day you shall go up out to the house of the Lord, and I will add to your days fifteen years. I will deliver you from this city and this city from the hands of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city for my own sake and for the sake of my servant David. And then Isaiah said, Take a lump of figs. So they took it and laid a boil, laid it on his boil, and he recovered. Here's a man who had a clear conscience. He had a clear conscience. He hadn't stolen. He hadn't lied. He did a lot of good things for God. And even though the word of the Lord came through the prophet and said, You're going to die. He turned to God and he bypassed the prophet. And he asked God for mercy. We should never give up on God's mercy. No matter what people say. No matter how great they are even in the kingdom of God. No matter what it looks like on the exterior. He turned to God and he said, God have mercy on me. Never give up on the mercy of God. And the prophet then had to turn around and say, you got 15 more years. See, the point of all these stories is this. God is a God of healing. All the way through the Bible, from the very beginning to the very end of the Word of God, God is a God of healing. He's a God of miracles. And in the Scriptures, there's many more miracles that we could have read about. We could have talked about Elisha. More miracles here, more miracles in Elijah. We could have talked about Job, how he was afflicted with Satan, and God turned it all around and healed him. We could have talked about the prophets. One of the prophets made a statement. He says, the son of righteousness will arise with healing in his wings. Healing is for today. It's as much for today as it ever has been. God has never changed. The Bible says he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if we just take God and we put him in this little box, we say, well, the miracles happen in the early church. Apparently the apostles had special anointing of power on their life. And we're so far away and removed from that, we don't have that same ability to believe for miracles. Then we hinder God. All these people acted in repentance, and they acted in faith, and they believed God for miracles, and God performed miracles. And God can still do miracles today. He can heal our lives. He can heal our loved ones. I believe God has never changed. This is not a doctrine that has gone out of date. It's for us now, and all we have to do is accept it and believe. God's a God of healing. I look around tonight, and I see that some folks aren't here for various reasons. I know that Sister Dixon, Brother Sister Dixon are not here, and Sister Dixon has been suffering from an illness. She's still quite sick and she needs a miracle I saw Joni earlier is she up there hi I, I see somebody there you are I see that hand I see that hand she needs a touch of God she needs a healing in her body there's others that need to be healed do you know somebody that needs a healing do you need a healing in your body this God has not changed he's exactly the same exactly the same all we have to do is come to him and God will heal us but we have to believe it Jesus said these signs will follow those who believe lay hands on the sick and they'll recover so will you stand with me tonight as we close in prayer and let us pray for those we know that need a miracle just the ones we mentioned here Sister Dixon needs a miracle Joni needs a miracle you might know somebody that needs a miracle. Bring that person before the Lord in prayer. Say, God, you healed in the Old Testament. You healed in the New Testament. You're a God of healing today, and we're going to believe you for a miracle. Holy Father, we come before you now. 
And we just honor you and we thank you for your grace. I thank you, God, that you're, you have never changed. Your ways do not change. Your love for us has never changed. Your power is still as evident in this earth as it's ever been. You are a God that heals all our diseases. And so now, this evening, oh God, we pray, you heal those who are sick among us. I ask that you touch Joni right now. I pray for healing to come into her body. I pray, Lord, that to the very source of the problem in her life, Lord, that healing will take place. You'll restore her health, and you'll raise her up. I ask God you touch Sister Dixon. I pray in the name of Jesus that you heal her of this affliction. I pray that you raise her up in the name of Jesus. And there's so many others, Lord, they need a miracle. And God, I pray for miracles to take place. Your word says if we humble ourselves and we pray, we will hear from heaven. And this week, this church is humbling themselves. We are fasting and we are praying and we're believing God for miracles. May they be evident this week. And testimonies will come forth in the name of Jesus. And we'll give you the honor and the glory and the praise in Jesus' name. And we all say amen. God's good, isn't he? God loves you. He's got good things in store for you. So before you leave, why don't you go to about 25 people and say hello to them. They say, well, I can't find 25 people. Well, just go to them twice. <laughs>